All right, um, then at this point, I will call the meeting of the Norton uh, Board of Water and Sewer Commissioners to order at 5.30 on July 12th. And uh, let's all start with the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I read them. I did. I went through them too. I have no questions. You good? Yeah, I'm all set. Yep. All right. Then I will go ahead and make a motion to approve the Town of Norton Board of Water and Sewer Commissioners meeting minutes for uh, June 29th, 2022 I meeting. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. I guess I should probably note that Steve Bishop is not present yet, for the record. Uh, so I'll run a meeting until he gets here. Um, having said that, I guess we'll go right to Frank for superintendent updates, please. Thank you. Got a few things to go through here, I'll try to go as quickly as possible. Um, Mr. Bishop just said that he's waiting for the host to let him in. Okay, so we'll be there shortly at some point. So, uh, drought, water levels, and flushing. Um, we remain in the level two drought um, despite the limited rounds of rain and thunderstorms that we have. Uh, it's going to take quite a bit to, to get us out of that category. I uh, spoke with uh, DEP um, yesterday, and they were actually going to be having another meeting with the Drought Advisory Committee to, uh, to look at uh, possibly changing the categories, uh, whether it be specific or, uh, or sporadic. Um, the town's daily water use has increased, which is typical for this time of the year. Uh, we're averaging about 1.2 to 1.4 million gallons per day. Um, as part of the normal operations, we use the water from the wells and from the storage tanks. Um, and what this does is allows us to turn over the water storage, keep the temperatures in the tanks low, um, keep the disinfection levels where we need it to be, and uh, we actually fill the storage tanks after a rain event or during low demand, which is typically you know, early morning hours or extremely yeah. late at night, uh, to make sure that we have the, the pressure and the fire suppression that we need. Um, also, during some of the low demand hours, um, primarily early morning, we have been actually out turning over some of the dead-end water mains, which is required by Mass DEP um, for the THMs and yep. for maintaining um, a, me a measurable disinfection residual in all of the distribution system. So basically, at our dead-end locations, when we go out and we do a chlorine sample, we have to have a detectable amount to make sure that the disinfection has made it to that point. Right. Um, sometimes that requires low-flowing hydrants to move disinfection down if the water usage isn't enough. All right. Yeah, we've talked about that, and it yeah. also causes too higher levels yeah. for the yeah. luxury. Exactly. You can pull cool. levels to the area um, where it doesn't move enough, and you have you extend your contact time. Frank, so how many of those we have? Dead end mains, we actually have probably about five. Okay. Um, it, it takes a decent amount of time to turn the water over on some of them based on their location. Um, and we have some other mains that are looped, but also have a low flow issue. Like so, on Pine Street. Like on Pine Street. Yeah. Um, so we did actually respond to a couple calls there. Um, the unfortunate event that happens with Pine Street more so than others is when we get one or two calls and you go out and flush, the other residents aren't aware that somebody had called. So sometimes that'll generate the trickle effect yeah. where they'll turn their water on and go to wash their car, do something different, and then they'll notice the discoloration that's in their service from the flushing that was done hours before. Right. Um, so there is really no blanket way to notify everybody that we're out in the area other than physically them seeing us there. Um, so this time of year is kind of difficult. People are out doing their things on the beaches, enjoying themselves. So it is not common for you know a return call to happen. And it's actually something that our disturbance that was in the water service, not in the main. But um, right now we are still responding to all calls. Um, and even though DEP is recommending that we really hold off on unnecessary flushing. You know, if it's warranted and it's an area that we obviously have a concern or we have multiple calls, you know, we're going to go out there and we're going to turn it over just to see what's going on. Yeah. We haven't gotten to a situation where 
this been anything that uh, has been extremely catastrophic. Um, we had two calls that were very odd to us and actually coming back to back at the beginning of the week. Um, one was at the low end of Dean Street and subsequently the very next phone call was pre-call lane, each of which went out from the hydrants right on. Assuming that's on right the other side of town. From, yeah. um, we actually opened up hydrants on either side of the complaint calls. They were crystal clear, spoke to each of the residents and it was something that they had noticed either over the weekend and they called or it was something that they were given the wrong information. So a lot of times uh, plumbers or maintenance personnel will tell the people that you know, if they have um, an irrigation system that isn't connected to town water but it's rusty, they tell them, call you, your water supply. Yeah. People automatically call the water department right. because they have town water but it's not supplied by their well. So a lot of times when we go out to calls like that, we educate the public. We turn the water over if necessary. 99%, thankfully, knock on wood, we're not seeing any disturbances out there. Um, Pine Street is a little di different because the water is isolated, doesn't move very much. What we typically see there are dirty laterals. The hydro laterals will run yep. 10, 10, 15 minutes at a very, very low flow rate. It's not the black and high levels of manganese water that we used to see. It's just a, a slight discoloration. And once that's removed, it appears that that yeah. section is good for quite some time. Those laterals, how long are they? Just like with the road? More they vary depending on where the water main is and how far off the road. So in that situation, is. you basically have that like pipe of water just sitting, you know, really sitting in there, like cooking off, getting the water, 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 water trickles out the end into the line. Uh, basically, as, as the water goes by, it slowly blend with there. Yeah. So it, it's just a situation down there, um, similar to what we see on some of the other data where we lose a residual. You know, we'll, well, we'll flush that, same thing, the hydrogen right. is dirty, you know, and go from there. Uh, How do you account for the water? Do you measure it? We do measure the water. Um, depending on what we're actually going to flush, either we do it um, by based, based on time with a, a flow chart, or we actually throw the meter on it, dechlorinate, and, and let it run, and then do it by, by the meter and by time. Most of the low flows are done as an estimate. But any of the higher flows, or if we're going to fill, um, you know, a truck with water or something like that, it's done by a measured, an actual calibrated meter with a backflow device on it. So, uh, you know, anything that goes that we flush water and it goes into uh, an area that may have run off into a wetland or something like that, we have a deplor device that we use that has the vitamin C tablets in it to wipe out any residual chlorine that's in it. It's typically not used for low flow flushing or even regular hydrant flushing. It's more for if you're going to do a superchlorination on a water main and then you have to dechlor afterwards. Um, but we have the device just in case. I mean, obviously, if you come very close to the water treatment facility, mm -hmm. that water is going to be significantly higher sure. than you would see, say, on this end of town. So it, it's at the, the person's discretion for who's doing the flushing if they feel it's necessary. But uh, we do have all of that equipment. Um, so the um, we actually responded to a leak. Uh, for a call that came in on June 30th, which was last Thursday, I believe, uh, on Fernandy Circle. Okay. A call came in, so there was water bubbling up on the ground. Um, crews actually responded and turned off the valve, which feeds that private way. Um, made contact with the person who called the, uh, the leak in, and it actually proved pretty difficult to find who runs the association there. Come to find out there actually isn't one. That's a private road, it's though? a private road. Um, well, we, the, we own water main, though. No, so we, we supply the water. Okay. The water main and services and hydrant are all owned by the private way. So is there, like, the equivalent of a curb stop on a 1.3 that... It, no, it's a gate valve. It's okay. an actual gate valve. Uh, a six-inch water main runs down there. Um, one hydrant with a loop, and each home is tied off of that. Right. Um, it's not a town-accepted road. It's not something that, again, we don't... We didn't accept the road either. It's, it remains private. I just think there's quite a few of those in town. So if something happens like that, we respond, we turn it off because we right. don't want our water sure. to be wasted. And then typically we would try and reach, um, you know, if there's a, um, an association member or, you know, a resident who's in charge. And what we had found out after speaking with a few of the residents down there is that when the homes were sold off outside of the Fernandes um, persons that had lived there yeah. all at once, there was never a maintenance agreement or anything like that, that was put in place. Um, a couple of the residents are, are rather upset about that and yeah. aware, but they've come to 
to understand the situation. So any bills that come in down there, whether it be for road repair or, or utility yeah. repair or something like this, is uh, is split between the residents that live there. So obviously, and that's not they don't even have a formal agreement on that. That's kind of like yeah. a handshake deal. No, yeah, I think they said like there's a common piece of property there that one person gets a tax bill for that they have to go. Everyone has to split. How many properties is it in that room? It's four, four or five. Okay. I can't remember. Not not too wow. many, but large large pieces of property. Yeah. You know. And uh, so we explained that to each of them as, as they called here and as they, they met with the crews out there um, on site. And um, we gave them a copy of our approved uh, drain layers and water and storage license list uh, so that they could pick who they wanted. You know, make some phone calls. Obviously, it was right before the holiday weekend, which yeah. was even more difficult. Um, they ended up getting a contractor who was not able to come out on Thursday, but was going to respond to Friday morning. So we met them um, on site, explained what was going on, explained where the leak was coming from. They, uh, they dug down, they actually found two leaks. Either side oh. of the hydrant tee had two small leaks. And uh, the contractor decided it was best to actually just replace that section of pipe and the tee assembly yeah. instead of doing you know the makeshift repairs, which probably would have gotten by, but it is. It's not the right thing to do. So I how long we can finally like let go big or I would have to say by like, looking at the trends, it was something that had just started. It was there was no indication, you know, the ground wasn't saturated, there was no sinkhole. You know, um, it seems like it's a, a well traveled road by the residents that live there. It's not something that's open to the public, so it, you're limited by the occupants of the road, but it was noticed uh, rather quickly. So uh, yeah, the contractor replaced the section of pipe. Also, they replaced the uh, the T, which feeds the fire hydrant. We uh, we were able to liven that up rather quickly. Um, one other issue that we had to deal with down there was the incorrect placement of the hydrant. So many many years ago, it was you know 500 or 1,000 feet as the crow flies. Yeah. And it didn't have to be at the end of the development or the end of the road. So of course, the hydrants installed before all the water services and before the loop. So uh, our foreman actually got to, to speaking with a few of the residents down there and uh, was able to gain access to the house furthest from the street, closest to the end of the loop, but not directly at the end. Yep. We actually pulled their water meter, put a space of our in, and had them run their hoses to remove the air and debris that was you know, stirred up by the, uh, the repair. And, and knock on wood, everything's been good since then. We've since returned and replaced the meter. Um, but again, there's a loop in this cul-de-sac that comes back to the original main, no hydrant on the end, and really no good way of flushing it out. And the air in the system is never a good thing, but you're very limited to what you can do yeah. at that location. Um, so we haven't heard any complaints about water quality, so hopefully... And there's nothing that will be done unless they do it. There's nothing that we can do. Um, they would have to basically hire a contractor to put in a second hydrant at the backside of the cul-de-sac which would be a benefit for them because these are pretty large yeah. homes, they're older homes, and they're definitely a distance away from the first hydrant, but again, it's a cost. Well, what do you suppose that project like that would run then if they were interested in doing it? The way things are right now, you can't get a hydrant <coughs> under $3,500. Yeah. And based on our specs, we go for a hydrant that's a little bit better at stainless steel internals. So even our price, we're, we're closer to $4,000. Um, which is what you'd want down there because of the water table. I'm sure they wouldn't want to do it, but I'm sure the fire department would. Oh, I'm sure they, the fire either. department would love to have an additional hydrant down there, but I think by the time you're done with that job, um, paying the crew, road repairs, I mean, probably that, looking at double. Yeah, double, I'd say double close price. to $10,000. So it's definitely not a small thing to be done. I wonder if that, if they could, if there's any kind of, uh, on their own, if there was any kind of grants or subsidies they could do to make that happen, there's nothing like that? Yeah. I would be surprised if there's something out there for yeah. that, but not at this moment. It, it is unfortunate. Um, it's it's not the only road in town that we see was installed that way. Where yeah, you know, before rules and regulations changed, before fires, distances between hydrants were were knocked down. It's uh, it's kind of concerning, but uh, again, we're, we're limited because it's private. We can't operate machinery and dig on private property, so it's definitely something. As you know, there's been three major fires over the last couple of days in three distinct towns. Mm -hmm. One was caused by, uh, caused by uh, smoking, of course. 
which has put um, Red Mill Village, where the trustees are talking about, you know, prohibiting smoking by contractors and other things. But in the case of Hingham, and in a lot of cases, they said it was poor water pressure. I'm not too sure. I'm sure there's more buzz out there than we know, but and there'll be more on it. Mm -hmm. But again, I would recommend, you know, it, it, it's always uh, easy to talk about shutting the barn door after the horse escaped. But this would be a proactive thing in, in order to make sure you have adequate water supply in your neighborhood. Yeah, well, you're very right. Yeah, I mean, you can have a million dollar fire department, but you're only as good as the water you can get out of the ground. Yeah. I'm sure the people at Hingham are not too happy to find that they're doing poor water pressure for their multi million dollar home. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, that and this, they should look at regulations based on housing size for 6,000 square foot Yeah, that we was a even, Couldn't even tell it was a 6,000 yeah. square foot anything. Yeah. And plus other houses got there. Yeah. 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 There were 125 and responded to that. Yeah, you imagine? Just, yeah, it was crazy. It was, it was quite the blaze. Yeah, we'll jump over to... Uh, public notices. So the TTM, TTHM notice was mailed out as I indicated at the last meeting was going to go out. Um, we did get a few phone calls about it. Uh, most people actually just question why the notice was sent to them and why it was sent to them in that fashion if it's not an emergency. Yeah. Um, you know, explain to most of these residents that uh, you know, it's required to go out by mass and it's, it's a law that it gets sent out. Uh, for an exceedance of the MCL, regardless of the exceedance amount, whether it's one part of the billion like ours was or 20, yeah. um, the same notice has to go out. Uh, it's again, it's an educational post. That's the intent, as we are told directly from SDP, for why that's sent out, why this pertinent information on there, um, just to educate the public on what substances are found in drinking water, whether it be in samples or in, in um, you know, an exceedance of an MCL. In that case, with the TTHM. So Frank, yep, and Steve and others. Uh, at Red Mill Village, everybody knows when some, such a letter is gone, I am now the person they go to. So you can thank me for the fact that you're not getting a phone call. Anymore. And by the way, I don't mind. I've told everybody if you have any questions about water or whatever. Sure. So uh, I got the same exact comment that people said, what? You know, they read it, and it's so technical. So poorly, as you know, it's so poorly written. Uh, I try to explain in, in basic English what the deal is. Um, so I know we're required by law to issue that. Can we not supplement that with English? Or is that not a lot? I, I didn't think it was. Yeah, it's, no. not it's, no. not. it's not an editable document. Um, and I know you mentioned last time that there's a committee that's going to be formed at DEP to do something better, I guess would be a better thing. Yeah. Uh, if you know they're looking for volunteers, I'd be vol easily sure. volunteer to be on that committee. Yeah. I think I told you all that when I was a former water commissioner, I was on the DEP advisory committee. The reason why I did that was I was tired of DEP dictating to cities and towns that within 30 days after they passed new legislation, they had to do X, Y, and Z. And I try to explain to them about budgets and fiscal years and, and other things, and they not a clue. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they have a clue now, to tell you the truth. Uh, it seems that way. We have conversations with DEP on, our, on a regular basis. Sometimes it's just about a basic question. Sometimes it's about an exceedance like this or a public notice. And each person that you speak to there doesn't seem to have the the understanding of how a municipality works. You know, it's it's a blanket policy that goes out. You know, they don't understand the impacts that that these notices have, other than the fact that they know that they're doing their job, making us put those out. But if there was some opportunity to send a letter along with it, or to change some of the wording, like you said, to well, simplify what's given out, it would go a long way to the public. You know, it's great that it says it's not an emergency, but people don't get that far down it. They, they see it. That's because of, of social media and text. I don't know about all you, but if a text comes in and it's two paragraphs, I don't even read it. <laughs> I mean, seriously. So yeah. we, we would, I mean, we yeah. really have to keep it simple when yeah. you want to get your message across yeah. nowadays. No, you're exactly right. So yeah, I so must have filled a half a dozen phone calls. Yeah, I mean, that's probably about as many as we got here, so I appreciate you doing that and uh, getting the information out. 
I mean, again, it's uh, it was I mean, one part of the billion. The, the issue with um, TTHM that many people don't understand is anytime you disinfect water, you create TTHM. And the answer to that is that nobody uh, understands mm -hmm. that. Right. And, nobody. You know, I've spoken to a few people. They started doing their own research online, and they were very surprised to find that there are higher levels of TTHM found in swimming pools that are heated and in hot tubs. It's, it's the same argument as nitrates, by the yes. way. Just eat a piece of bacon if you want to be surprised about nitrates. Yeah, you, you nailed it, yeah. Um, you ever want to read my master's report? I'm sure you don't, but it's all about that subject. So, so. But, uh, yeah, so some of the calls, probably the same ones that you were getting, you know, why am I getting this notice if it's not an emergency? You know, why are they being mailed out to everybody, and who pays for that? That was a common one. Yeah. Oh, I didn't get that one. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, I explained to them that, well, the water department has to pay for it out of its general operating budget. You know, it's, uh, I believe it was thirty-four or $3,500 for that notice to go out. Um, you know, again, it's... What was the total number that went out? How many? I honestly don't remember. Brooke, do you remember the total number? I don't. It was... I think it was like 9000 It was a lot. 9000 yeah. To go to every resident in town, whether you have water or not, it went to people with well water. Yeah. We had a few calls. Um, Did it go to businesses, too? Anybody listed as a so resident. Anybody had... Oh, as a resident, yeah. Okay. Um, and that was required by Mass DEP. Um, again, it's educational. So you commercial know, buildings aren't required to have that notice either, right? Whoever the owner occupant, it would have went to that person. Oh, okay. I think that's okay. the reason why it goes to every single person. So if you work in a location in town where the owner may be out of town, yeah. all of the people who potentially work there would know or would find out about it by by conversation. Um, but again, this is something, you know, it's not town-wide. It's isolated to one sample that was taken and at, the to end, at the end of a dead-end location. Um, yeah, it's just, it is, it is confusing to everybody, let alone the people that, uh, you know, don't read the entire notice yeah. that goes out, so it's unfortunate. Uh, but yeah, the biggest thing was, you know, who pays for it, and ultimately, like I said, it comes from the water operating budget, so that's on the, the backs of the ratepayers. So they, most people were very displeased with that as, as the answer. Um, the, um, there he is. Yeah, he has, he has made it. Hey, Steve. Hi, kids. Sorry, I'm going to cough. I, had, I was on you earlier. No problem. I guess we'll say for the record, we got Steve Bishop here now at uh, 5.52. I've actually been on. I'm just coughing. Okay. Yeah, no worries. So, uh, so as I mentioned, you know, uh, <coughs> TTHMs and other detectable things are found in, in water that is disinfected. It's just common. You know, the levels that are set for the THM is 80 parts per billion. You know, our sample result that came in after we did the average was 81 parts per billion. So we're going to hover around that number, and based on the way that the samples are taken and averaged, you know, it's very likely that we're going to see another level exceedance in a previous in a, in a superseding quarter because we've had an elevated amount in this quarter it's just the way that the sample averages work um, if we get a very cool summer and the water cools off typically the disinfection is uh, is lowered in the system as the temperatures change and we will see less results in the distribution system but uh, there's multiple factors leading to the reason why the chlorine is higher than it needs to be, and we're actually working on that. We have been for quite some time. Um, part of that is actually a meeting that we have tomorrow with Mass EP and our engineers. That's to go over the TTM exceedance evaluation report um, that was required to be done by an engineer um, for the initial exceedance of TTM back in November 2021. We have 180 days to submit okay. an engineer's report and evaluation of the system. Um, including samples and any other detects or anything that had changed, construction, um, issues with flushing, you know, building, anything like that could goes on that could affect the, uh, the circulation of the water in those areas, you know, nothing of which is really going to affect this sample location. Um, even the work that's going on on 123 doesn't affect that area. Um, so we have a, a meeting with them tomorrow. Mass, Mass DEP is uh, 
going to review the documents that we provided to them. I don't know if we forwarded you a copy. I think we had a draft, so we can get a copy of that over to you guys if you haven't seen it. It's a multi-page report that was done by Weston and Sampson. Um, it takes into account our optimal water quality samples that we've been taking now for uh, for quite some time. We actually have uh, two quarters remaining to take um, additional data, and as part of those two quarters, as recommended by DEP, we're going to also take TOC samples um, at our sources to help determine if the, the potential of increase to pH is actually not just the pH level, but an organic that could be coming in naturally found in drinking water. We don't believe that to be the case, but until we have these sample results, we can't prove that as you know, a non-issue. Um, but that will be the first step, is having a meeting with them tomorrow. We've talked and mentioned many, many times that our goal is to get the pH lowered, um, which was increased by Mass DEP based on a very old and outdated study um, after another entity, which was a school department, um, had issues passing their lead and copper samples. Um, you know, we're not you know, high-level chemists, but basic chemistry tells you that you know, if you run a distribution system with a very high level of pH that you have to add additional disinfection to get the same characteristics. Yep. So if we had a, if we were at a lower pH like we used to do uh, going back probably seven years ago, it requires less disinfectant to get the same free chlorine residual in that same body of water. So, that's so they raised the pH in order to, uh, because of the lead and copper levels, right? Yes. So on the school system, have we eliminated the lead and, and the lead and copper in the school system? The school system continues to have issues with one of its oldest locations with exceedances. Um, we have never had an exceedance in the distribution samples that we take, so it was very odd to us that Mass DEP required to change in pH based on samples that weren't representative of the distribution system. So the schools yeah, not one of our is the schools not one of our sampling points? They are not part of our regular sampling. They are a voluntary basis. Um, it's a total separate report that gets done for the schools and daycares. They are not part of our 90th percentile um, information that is done at specific homes that meet criteria based on age of building and materials that are used. Any, any exceedances we've had on the distribution system are generally the exact same locations because of internal plumbing. You know, the, the, I don't know how much you know about lead and copper sampling, but you get all your distribution samples and your 90th percentile of that has to be below the lead limit. We haven't even come close to touching that. It's yeah. usually one, maybe two, usually one of the same distribution place that fails all the time. And so it's not a water quality issue. It's a internal or sample collecting procedure issue. So um, that was the original problem with the schools to begin with. The samples aren't correct, collected properly. The pre-sampling procedure wasn't handled properly, so the numbers were through the roof, and we had to raise the pH. So, so yeah. these samples at the schools taken at the water fountains, or they, are they taken at some other location? No, the fountains know? have all been removed. Okay. Um, they're taken at the kitchen sink and the nurse's sink, um, two separate areas, um, but they feel that they have the highest possibility of being having water consumed from them whether if you went to the nurse and you got an aspirin or something. So they, they pick where those samples are taken. It's not taken from the science lab where somebody's going to wash their hand. They're more worried about consumption. And if the samples are taken correctly, the samples are indicative of the water that's in the plumbing after a certain period of time. These are not samples that are taken and you run the water forever so you get cool water from the distribution system. You know They're focused on the plumbing and the fixtures inside each of these buildings. So. Um, one of the exceedances at the schools was indicated. We believe it was a, an error in sampling technique. Mass DEP required them to actually replace the entire faucet because they couldn't prove otherwise. The repeat sample came back and it was fine. So it proved that more than likely it was a faucet issue. Mm -hmm. They would make them replace it with a lead free, you know, certified lead free faucet, um, and they have done that. But issues with schools of, with age are that you know you have miles and miles of plumbing in these schools sure. and if they were built during a certain time frame you also have the same amount of solder that could contain a high level of lead which is basically the target 
reason for these samples to be taken. You know, and that's it, why the pH is high. Exactly. So it does. DEP is targeting the pH at a higher level to help the schools, but it also hinders the operation of our system and our water quality. So it's it's really a balancing act and where we can't prove 100% that the, the samples were taken incorrectly. Everything points that way, that as John mentioned, procedures weren't followed prior to and during samples. Are you trying to tell me the schools weren't following instructions? Yes. I, 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 yes. Funny. I don't. Who does the physical sampling for the schools, whoever they decide it is given to whoever we give it to, um, Wade, he distributes it or takes it himself, we really don't know. Um, I don't believe he was the one who did I don't that. Think so. The one that made us raise the pH, right. I don't think he was involved in that. Um, but. So most sample levels are indicated high, and if a repeat sample is done and the person has followed the instructions correctly, you see it. A major decrease in the sample. You know, we see the same thing at the schools. We see the same things. If it had, uh, years ago we had a daycare that had a higher level, and the person that was running the daycare was a standing person, didn't read the the paperwork with the directions. So you know, it's very important that they're filled out correctly. A lot of times we get bottles back that are no good. We have to deny the sample and then bring them a new bottle. Um, but there's directions in place for a reason. And obviously, there could be costs associated with not following those directions, which the schools have found out. You know that asking people will require that they upgrade their plumbing. If it comes to a fact that the plumbing was upgraded and you still have a bad sample, well, now they want to look a little bit further. You know, it could be plumbing under the sink, it could be plumbing under the floor, in the wall, and uh, they will not um, allow that device to go back online until you have a sample that clears. They could actually require the device to be removed completely. Now, removing a nurse's sink or a kitchen sink is a big deal. Yeah. So, so you know, as is the following of the rules and regulations that are provided to you of how to sample. So it's un unfortunate that you know it gets that way. And it's unfortunate that the town has had to deal with the changes, you know, to try and help them out. Which, like I said, it, it has caused some issues in town, and that's what we're trying to uh, to straighten out by getting those numbers lowered. Um, the other thing I will mention is the uh, the manganese notice was uh, sent out. Um, that is not required to be a direct mail. That is posted in uh, local town businesses, town hall, library here. Um, it's in the newspaper, and it's on both websites on town, uh, water department and norton.org. Um, again, it's supposed to educate the public. They, um, they also generate a few calls each time they go out. Again, it's not an emergency. It's yeah. just to educate you that you know a sample uh, that was taken in the previous quarter, mind you, these these samples yeah. um, notices that go out were from samples that were taken in the previous three months, and uh, you know they have to be put out ten days after. Were these the raw samples? The, yeah, these are raw samples for the well, right? These are raw samples, right? You are correct, Steve. Before blending. Yeah, before blending, taken at uh, source locations. Our sample indicates that we take in the distribution system have actually been ND for a few rounds now. So the blend uh, by using well one less and the water treatment facility and well three more has gotten out there. You know, um, as demand increases, we do have to rely a little bit more on well one, which obviously is not our favorite thing to do, but we have to meet demand. And you know, if we're at 1.2 to 1.3 on. 85 degree day, we we have no choice. We have to, yeah. you know, we have to use what we have available to us because we're we're dealing with supply chain issues for the replacement wells. So we still haven't had the contractor out there for five and six. So jump across to. Um, there's been some discussion. I know I did get two calls. I figured I would get more. Um, I don't know if it made the paper or not, but somehow information has gotten out about the new health advisories for. Um, PFOS, PFOA, Gen X, and PFBS. So currently these are just advisories, but they're far stricter than what MassDEP has in place right now uh, for the PFOS 6, which is 20 parts per trillion. Right? Um, basically the levels that they're setting are unachievable levels. It, it might as well be zero. Um, yeah. You know, If the advisories turn into enforceable MCLs, you're going to be dealing with 
routine public notices for every water supplier, not just Norton. Um, and, and then also, obviously, there's going to be public educational requirements um, separate from the public notice. You know, they're, they're talking about having informational sessions at libraries where people can come and, and get information. Um, the thing to, to remember is that these contaminants are not from the water system. They end up in the, the aquifers because they're produced from just right. about everything you can think of. Um, it, it's very unfortunate that they still allow those compounds to be in products and continue to leach into the water, and then they rely on the water communities to, uh, to clean it up. There's still chemicals that are being used that have those PFAS and PFO in it. Um, one thing I actually did find out about, I think I even mentioned at the last meeting, um, I was unsure of what the Gen X was and what the PFBS was, and come to find out they were actually um, synthetics that were designed to mask the PFAS and PFOA, so they have the same properties. So these are just a few contaminants <laughs> that uh, out of thousands in this contaminant family. So the concern is that uh, if we test and say we exceed this four parts per quadrillion limit for you know, P4, and we build a facility to remove that contaminant years down the line, probably only a few years, they're going to find additional contaminants in this same group of contaminants that they're going to set an MCL for after setting an action level. You know, the last thing any community wants to do is spend hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars on a filtration plant just to find out five or six years down the road that it doesn't remove this new contaminant yeah. that they've now set a level for. So you know, hopefully there's a little bit more guidance that comes along um, once these do, and uh, they're going to happen. If, if they have an action level, it's going to be an MCL at some point in the near future, but uh, definitely need some more guidance on what their future thoughts are. You know, we've been taking samples, and I know Steve can, can go back on this. Um, UCMR is uh, unregulated containment monitoring rule. They give us a list of samples, all of which you can't pronounce. You couldn't spell them if you wanted to, and they don't set any detect limit. We have to pay probably thousands of dollars a year to take these samples, and all the DEP and EPA do is gather information from each community of what the sample results were. Then they go back and they put it into a form, and they figure out what elevated levels they found for that specific sample and topic. Now they come up with an action level, they come up with an MCL for it, right. because it was all found within a certain area. And that's, so basically we funded. So they're, they're looking to find out exactly what's there, and then they're using that data to come up with the levels. And our costs. Which are probably slightly below what's actually there. Yeah, exactly. That, that's just how it works, which is fine. I mean, if these are as bad as they say they are, sure, we want to remove them um, from the water. But I know UCMR 5 is coming down in the near future, and they have mentioned that there's going to be 29 additional PFAS samples, and the other one that, that was added to make 30 was going to be lithium, which is a runoff from um, the solar panel batteries. Uh -huh. <laughs> so all major concerns, so everybody has Switched yeah. to solar. Solar has ended up in cranberry bogs. You know, oh, so the rain is dragging lithium off the solar panels. The, off the panels, not the, the off the batteries. Off the batteries. And it's getting into the aquifer. And it's oh. so depending on what the levels are set for that, that's just like I said, another thing to think of in the future. I don't know if there's any one specific type filtration system that is the remove all catch all for these type of things. I know Mansfield just dealt with. PFAS at one of their nearby facilities and the plant that was built that they had in their parking lot is working phenomenal, but they could run into the same thing five years down the road though exactly. if that right. facility doesn't take out the new whatever they come up with. Right, or the new levels that they're yeah. looking for. Yeah, I don't know how you treat lithium. I have to look it up. Yeah. <laughs> you sure you haven't done that yet? No. <laughs> I'll know by the end of the, end of the day. Um, so that's what I have for updates. Um, both Tara and Steve were not able to make it tonight. Um, they both have items going on. So I do have a he sent an email yep. uh, with a sewer update. We have a copy of that somewhere. Yep, and I'm online. Oh, it is Tara. Oh, just, Tara. Just, not, just not in person. Okay. Hi, Tara. Tara. Hello. Well, we want to let Tara go and then we'll show up with Steve's update. Do you want to uh, 
tell us about water tower? I sure can after Frank teed that up perfectly. Uh, <laughs> yes, doom and gloom, but the good news is that we are currently no is under the MCL and there are a lot of other systems in the surrounding areas that are a lot worse off. So, um, as far as PFAS goes and all the extra on the additives, but uh, as far as the actual wells five and six program goes, uh, we have been in communication with the contractor. We're working on a schedule and trying to set up a site meeting. They have been dropping off some equipment. Uh, the longer lead item, it sounds like, which we were pretty sure was going to be the case, are the electrical items. So the BFDs are probably not going to be delivered till uh, October. And, um, you know, with the current peak demand season anyway, I don't think we we're going to be taking five or six offline anytime soon, but we're gearing up to start to work on six uh, this fall. So hopefully get that wrapped up and then start immediately over at five. It shouldn't take them too long once we uh, actually get out on site, but again, we're just waiting for an official schedule from them. And I think I've been saying that for a bunch of meetings so far, but uh, we want to get out there and make sure Con comes happy and everybody's happy to work before we get some digging in the groups out there. So. Uh, and then we also, um, for Wells 4, uh, last night was the Conservation Commission meeting. Uh, the uh, in notice of intent, uh, we're good to go with that. The DP issued a final number, I think the day after the last meeting, so that was the only thing that was holding up the approval process, and we'll hopefully get the order conditions. We have a draft copy of it already. Uh, the official order conditions will go to Frank, hopefully yeah. soon. It's in, it's in uh, interdepartmental mail as in? we speak. So. All right. Oh, actually, awesome. I, I think Thanks. they might actually be waiting until Monday, because uh, I think um, the conservation agent is still out until oh. the end of the week, so we might be waiting until Monday. But. Right. So the good news is we um, we have that now on file and we can start moving forward with uh, scheduling the driller. We'll obviously need to meet on site first and get all of our sediment controls up and have a pre-construction meeting with the conservation agent. But uh, that's going to be uh, running up for the next month or two, um, likely probably the next two months actually. Uh, the driller, um, they're probably going to start in October-ish. That's what their goal is right now as well. So, um, Why so late? Uh, Frank Selwood is busy. We've been trying to make sure we get him on the schedule, and if you get him on the schedule and you can't start, then you can't. No, I can't. Yeah, so then he just pushed it. But yeah, his, uh, so this is a you know larger well, so test wells and stuff. He's got different crews for that, but for the actual uh, you know, production well, it's going to take a little bit different rig. Uh, okay. That was the update I just got this week, so. Um, to open earlier, but um, you might bring out a sub to try to you know expedite. But in the meantime, uh, that's that's the current schedule right now. Okay. And he'll work through the winter. He did that on five and six, so uh, that won't impact his work until you know it gets too cold. But uh, usually that doesn't set in February ish, so we should hopefully have it all wrapped up by then. The uh, White Street contracts, uh, we got those over to Gravity Construction. They're working on putting all the paperwork together for that. So over the next few weeks, uh, we'll have Mexican contracts in front of you. Um, possibly by the next meeting, uh, we'll try to get them in as soon as possible. But the um, uh, the intent is for the contract to start work this fall. Uh, they want to get the pipeline in, in the ground, and they do have some pipe available. So that was good news to hear. We don't need to wait until next year. Uh, for supply chain issues. Um, so that's their intent is to uh, wrap up that uh, this fall so they can actually uh, do the final paving next spring slash summer. So good news on that front. Uh, and then I think, Frank, the only thing I had on my list here is the uh, AWIA binder. I think uh, that's still hanging around your offices. I think there's some edits in there that we just want to fine tune a couple little minor things. But uh, next meeting I'll be in person on the 26th, barring any other issues. But um, I'll I'd like to come in and pick that up just so we can wrap up a couple of the final things and get uh, the permanent uh, printed copies to you. Okay. And then I don't really have any answers for Steve's email, but I know that he had um, some just minor updates. Post -up. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty basic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, sure. the Holly Road, Holly Road in Nova generated. I can't even speak to that. I need sleep. <laughs> Final review documents, plans, and specifications. Uh, they were provided. Um, they have been reviewed. We, we can get a hard copy to you guys if you need that. Um, bid schedule is to be provided and discussed at the next meeting. Um, the town municipal 
uh, sewer complex. We have a copy of the draft memo. I don't know if that was sent to you guys or not. Um, it was. Okay. We, uh, John and I have been reviewing that. Um, gives the town multiple options of what they would uh, yeah. need to choose. Uh, we assume which one that they are going to go with, and uh, we'll let them make a final decision on that. Um, the final memo on that is going to be delivered uh, to the town manager um, after the next meeting. I think uh, Steve wanted to have a discussion about that with everybody. Um, the Norton Public Schools, the uh, sewer I&I &I investigation is actually scheduled for the end of the month. Um, we had long believed that the L school, based on age, may have some uh, drains that may have actually be going at the time into their septic system, which now has been transferred to the municipal sewer, so that needs to be verified. Um, so Western and Samson will be able to do a study at the school. And um, we finished the SSO um, public notification plan. Um, John Potts and myself had, had worked on that and got that off um, before the deadline. And, um, Attached with that is the uh, the public awareness of sewer pollution. Uh, that's about it for what Steve has here. Stuff that he and I and other persons from Western and Sampson have dealt with in the past two weeks. Um, question on these the sewer options here. I'm looking at this map, option two, that goes down 123. Mm -hmm. um, is that assuming if they were to go to that with that option that that would end up being after the moratorium on the road? Oh, yeah. So this is years down the road. Uh, discussing that as one of the reasons it's probably not. Okay. Yeah, it's basically recommended six. Recommended six, yeah. yeah. It was a very thorough report. It, very good report, yeah. yeah. But a couple of the, I mean, it's just options. That's all I think, it, is. I think yeah. it was one of, the, one of the more cheaper ones, you know, the cheapest one. It was the well, cheapest. Well, the one that made most of Was it the cheapest? One of the six. The cheapest. Made, I mean, they'll still have to cross Route 6, but they can easily tunnel under it, so. Six. I mean, uh, <laughs> it's a pretty uh, good idea. He's that's a head. long ways to go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have had to say that uh, somebody named Harrop might have uh, presented that as an option. Uh, it is the most cost-effective. It's probably the easiest of access. Yeah. Um, I know Steve and his guys and the sewer department were out did some uh, flow test calculations at the center pump station, which we call the Wheaton pump station. Uh, to determine if there were going to be any impacts based on the operational run times at both locations. And it was determined that even if there were, we could put a hold on the smaller station, which would be the municipal complex, um, while the Wheaton College station was running and have it so that they would talk to each and other so that wouldn't okay. have the fighting of the pumps, which is obviously the biggest concern when you tie in multiple systems. Yeah, that's very um, common. We would prefer that a, a different option is chosen, which would benefit the sewer department and the other residents along Elm Street. Um, yeah. But obviously, that's probably the most expensive option. And unless the, I believe it's the Greenworks grant or the Massworks grant, one of them that they applied for, unless that comes through, I don't see the town looking at that as a viable option, even though it would benefit many, many people, um, including the Reed and Barton facility. That in order to be built on is going to have to have some type of... But that was like the way expensive. That, yeah, exactly. Um, it's the it's furthest away. It's, yeah. it's the way, yeah. So the other options um, down here, option six, it, is that, does that open up stuff for butters or does it not being a force main? Is it not? Like I'm thinking back to that conversation that we had about availability of sewer or are we going to no, the way that that would have to work, because of the size of the pumps that are going to be at the municipal station, there would have to be a separate gravity main that would run back to that municipal wet well, and then right. the waste would be discharged from there. So, so we can put that in, and it doesn't qualify as yeah. forcing someone to right. have their, I guess, yep. seven years now. To right. Okay. Yeah, because then you get into the same thing that you deal with uh, issues with multiple pumps running at the same right. time. So right. we had a, a homeowner pump for lack of terms, an E1 pump, yeah. which is very common in Norton, you know, it could be running at full head and not able to discharge into the sewer right. pipe because the Despite pipe pressure is already in there. Sure. Exactly. So, you know, it, it becomes an issue with uh, which pump is going to win and just not something you want to get into. Yeah. Uh, there's no way to have them all communicate so that they only run 
when one station is down, you know, you're dealing with the homeowner's portion yeah. as opposed to a town-owned portion. So, uh, but those are the options that are there. You know, I know Steve and I believe Ryan spent quite a few hours um, working on that with John Howard, myself, and Bruno yeah. um, to come up <coughs> with those options. So that will be presented. To see which one the town wants to uh, to accept. Because it's the only one under a million. So when you say the town, roughly under a million. The municipal committee, is the town that you're referring to? Uh, Mike Units and the select board, I believe, would be the ones that would be deciding on that. Um, that may even have to go to town meeting for funding approval. Mm -hmm. um, it's a rather, it's a substantial mm -hmm. amount. Mm -hmm. that we would have to assume mm -hmm. yeah. um, that that's not going to be covered under the, the general fund. Wouldn't they go with our recommendation? Uh, I'm just saying. Are they even going to ask our recommendation? I don't believe so. Okay. We can present them with all the information. We can explain to them what we feel is the best option for us. I think the only way that they may take a recommendation from us is if we do partial funding. Um, something that the sewer department hasn't thought of, it hasn't been discussed, but it could come as up as discussion. Um, they did listen to us they see that. somewhat as far as things we felt were relatively not great ideas, um, mm -hmm. like tying into North Cottage and right. having to take responsibility of that line. Well, we don't want to do that. Yeah, we've no. talked about the past, we don't want to do that. No, no, two options so, that had right. bright lines, they noticed were immediately off right. the table. So. So, so, I mean, that's not recommended by us and definitely not recommended by our engineers. You know, so the town would be foolish to take that in and want to go that right. route. Right. We've given them the best options and multiple options that they can choose with a wide array of prices. Um, you know, again, if the town wants to get into a, an agreement with the sewer department to do what we think is a better option, right. I'm sure we can discuss that as and come up with like the Elm Street job. I mean, it's definitely more, a lot more money up front, but. Yeah, it's probably better for the town and revenue long term. Yeah, they yes. long term, and it's going to open up the door. Oh, so. well, sure, most definitely. I mean, the other issue a lot more customers, I imagine. Oh, definitely. But the other issue that comes with Elm Street is actually we would be dealing with um, funding on the water department side because right. the water main in that area also needs to be replaced. So if you're going to open up the road, well, you're going to do a lot of utilities while you're there. more money you're replacing that. Yeah. So I mean, two separate enterprise accounts. You know, obviously, more than likely they could fund. Both of those, you know, it would be would probably be an article in the town meeting you know, to get approval to spend the funding in each, each of the departments, um, and it had to be explained that uh, you know obviously it's a joint venture between the water, the sewer, and the town, you know, to benefit multiple properties along right, the way, right. and obviously you know facilitate road improvements which are needed down there, um, you know, whether it be catch basins, drainage, stuff like that, so that there's no reason to go back in that road. You know, for 10 or 15 years. So the municipal complex is going to have its own pump station? Correct. Whose pump station is that? The town would like the sewer department to take that over and... No, it was a rhetorical facility. question, so I don't understand why we're not involved with the decision since we're going to end up taking yeah, over the municipal the pumping stations. Isn't it, it, that, it's illogical to me. I, just saying it publicly, just more. throw it out there. I couldn't agree more. We, we would prefer that it be designed in a way that can facilitate additional growth, even if it's not immediate, but in the future. Um, that was in some of the wording on this uh, document that's been provided to them or will be provided. Um, doesn't mean that they have to accept that as something. That of the options, do. that's really the only one that would facilitate future growth, right? Yes. The other ones are all pretty much. The other ones are, are pretty much cut and dry. Yeah. Um, one of the options was to go down 123 and connect to the um, West Main Street sewer project yep. at the Common, yep. that would actually utilize the old water main as, you know, could be a, a sewer pipe could be sleeved inside the old oh, water main, okay. but that water main is still active. So that would facilitate a water upgrade project yep. from Elm Street to the center, which does need to be done at some point in order to abandon that water main in place to be used to sleeve the sewer. Right. So it's there's just multiple things that are going on. Timing couldn't be worse with Mass DOT um, ahead of schedule. We're going to put a moratorium on that road you know, because that Do we is have a ballpark of when that's going to 
go down. It is ever changing. Yeah. Supposedly, yeah. the end of the fall, but end of the fall, the end of this fall. I'd be surprised. They didn't start till middle of June, so. So as an update on that, we do have a section of water main that is actually off. Um, it's been down for about a week now. It's the old section that's going to be abandoned from what is essentially what we call Conway Country, which is just before the interceptor and the train trestle home, okay. um, to 495. So all the okay. services have been tied over, all the hydrants have been tied over in that area, and we have that section off. We turned it off after the 4th to make sure that you know, it's off and that there's nobody that's just out on vacation yep. and not been tied over. Um, we've double, triple checked our numbers, made sure that everything that we know is there is tied over. Um, so now that can be cut off and discontinued because a portion of it does need to be removed in order for Verizon to upgrade their utilities in that same area. So that will be something that will be coming up probably within the next couple of weeks. There will be a shutdown um, of the 12-inch main and that should put probably five houses out of water. And we're trying to work with the contractor. We're hoping that they can dig one day play the trench and then come back the next next day, start right away with the open hole, you know, remove the plate and then do the tie over. It's a cut and cap of the cross tie connection between the two pipes. So the actual physical labor part of it won't take a lot, but the, if you have to have it shut down, dewatered, excavate, then do the work, it's obviously going to be a length of time. It could be five, six hours. Okay. Um, so we want, we talked to the contract, we said we want to give as much notice as possible to these residents. That's so, as we said, yep. the notice is letting yep. know. That's we would we'll definitely let them know that's going to happen. Um, and this has to be during the day? We're going to allow much. it to happen during the day because it's obviously the best option for the contractor. Yeah. Um, it is impactful for four or five residents, yeah. unfortunately. Hopefully those people are working during the day. Um, yeah. You know, Initially, all shutdowns were going to be done, done at night, but obviously there's additional challenges that come with night work. You know, not, not alone with the cost, but you lose the contractor's crew for the day either prior or after because obviously not right. going to work for the 24 hours. So we're trying to do our best to work with them. Um, we've had some information that was different. Originally the plans indicated that one of our valves, um, which was installed many years ago when 495 went in, we had it down on the plans that it was a cross tie valve after the exploratory dig. It's actually a line valve on the 12, so it benefited everybody because now we don't have to install another 12 inch valve, okay. which would have been another shutdown. So, you know, it still operates the same way and still cut the water off the same way, which is why we couldn't determine what main it was on when we did our hydro flushing program. So, the only way to do it was to do an exploratory dig, and that's what was determined. So that saves the contractor time, obviously saves us money and the state money. So that was a, a welcome um, discovery. On top of that, the hydrant in front of 192 East Main is actually going to remain in place and active. So because of the positioning of that 12-inch valve, when we did an isolation, we determined that there was no way to have a hydrant on either side of 495 which any time you have a bridge crossing or a water crossing, it's always beneficial to have a hydrant either side and a right. gate out, out, outside of those hydrants so you can flush either way, um, you know, maintain water quality. And God forbid there was an emergency, you could isolate it. Right. Um, so we are going to leave that hydrant in place, supply them with a new hydrant, and so there's going to be a hydrant at 192 and almost one directly across the street. So it, it benefits the fire department to yeah. one more hydrant in town. It works out in everybody's favor to leave it there. So. Are there any, um, there's no businesses on that stretch that's getting shut down, is there? It's just residents? There are yeah, no businesses. So definitely, they're, they're moving along, they're, they're way ahead of schedule. Um, they've been doing all right. Pretty soon they should be starting the laterals to the businesses, which are going to require pressure test and chlorination. So I believe once they're cleaned up all the way down at 495, they're going to go back and start at Elm Street and work their way back towards the Washingtons. Um, there's some other conflicts with utilities in the area, so that they, they really want to move along and, and get some of that water main shut down because, again, Verizon has old Ma Bell that they found that was they were unaware of. They have their new Verizon that's there, um, and then they have to put in additional banks in the way. So 
everybody's kind of waiting on them where it was the other way around in the beginning. We were waiting on the utilities to get out of the way, the telephone poles and stuff like that. Um, they took priority, so definitely a work in progress down there, but it, it is still moving. talk about that we are still up in the air about that um, I reached out again today to the town manager and the accountant they neither one have heard from the congressman's office um, I have not and we have to assume that there may be a stall on the funding or it may not happen at all so in the next two weeks we're going to have a discussion with the town manager and the accountant on what may need to be done to continue um, the funding for Wells 5, 6, and 4. So 5 and 6 have funding in place that was originally appropriated um, many, many years ago. And we've been paying bills for Weston and Sampson out of those funds, and we've started to pay uh, Dankris out of those funds. The concern is that we don't have the total amount to pay off the 5 and 6 without acting on our already approved borrowing of 725000 so we've held off on borrowing that because we didn't want to sit and pay back the debt knowing that we weren't going to spend the existing money that we have remaining. Um, then the auction clause funding came about, so we are everything kind of went that way and we were focusing on that. There is So we may have to default back to that? We may have to go back to that, which would mean well four would have to be proposed at a town meeting to be done in-house because the congressman was going to pay for Wells 4, 5, and 6 right. in its entirety, which was 1.475, I think. Mm -hmm. um, we can't really even count on it. Unfortunately, no. It's looking that way. Um, so the questions that we, we have for the town manager and for the accountant are something that um, we're all going to sit down within the next couple of weeks uh, with Tara and try and come up with an option. So there's limitations on what the federal money can pay back. Um, it's my understanding that you cannot pay back a borrower okay. with the federal money. So that brings a portion of the money that we already have that's borrowed as non-reimbursable. Yeah, so it's messed up since it's paying for what it's supposed I, to be I know for anyway. Um, whether there's some misinformation that's going around or, you know, it's such a new thing that yeah. there's just not much direction on it. So that's why we're going to have to sit down and talk about that. So we have the approval from a previous town meeting for that 725000 to be borrowed. We've just held off on it. So if we need to, that would finish out borrowing that on top of what we currently have would pay off the work for Dankers to do at Wells 5 and 6. We would get our two new wells, and then we would start the process with Well 4. Um, we've done phase one at Well 4, which was drilling and testing to find a new location. That was paid for by ARPA money, which was $60,000 probably a year and a half ago. Um, the question is, is there ARPA funding available to continue with that well um, and not focus on the congressman? Just a lot of unknowns. Yeah. We want to make sure we get our, our numbers in order. And we definitely don't want to borrow additional money if it can't be reimbursed. So the only option that I see, and again, it hasn't been discussed, would be funding the remaining half of the Wells 5 and 6 project from retained earnings. If that can be reimbursed with congressman money, that would be the best option for the department. Yeah. But it puts you in, us in a bind because this is the lowest our retained earnings have been for many, many years for multiple different reasons, mainly because of payback on projects. Right. So, you know, taking 700, 725,000 from retained earnings is a gamble, especially if you don't get reimbursed. Because now you can't borrow to put the 725 back into your retained earnings. 
So it, it, there's just a lot of moving parts. We, yeah, we need to know the particulars of what you can and can't right. pay back with. with that, that's the biggest concern. And depending on what those are, it sounds like we ought to just assume, we're, don't assume we're going to have that until we actually have it. Right. Yep. In, you know, in the bank. Yeah. So it's unfortunate. I don't know what's going on in Washington. We haven't, again, we haven't heard back from them. Yeah. You know, even a, a simple email back and forth, still working on it, would be great. But um, I don't know what their schedule is, when they're in, when they're out, who, who's on vacation. So it's, it's not surprising that we don't hear back from them on a regular basis. But uh, you guys will be updated as soon as we know a little bit more about it. Uh, it it's just it's an unfortunate nice situation. Have an exe executive session with the board. It would be great if we could do that. Yeah. Yeah. And James. So everyone's on yeah. the same page. It would be awesome. Everything. It would be. Yeah. Everybody asks the same questions. And I'll be here to hear the answers to the questions that are asked. Uh, but Even yeah. if it's, you know, can we make that happen? I, I don't see why yeah. not. Um, we may end up doing two meetings. We may do something with uh, Tara, James, Mike, and myself, and then we can bring the board in after that. Just, I mean, if they don't have answers, there's no sense of trying to coordinate everybody yeah. together, which is very possible. They may not know exactly what's going on or what the best avenue is. So at least we have the approval for that 725, which yeah. is something I had asked for a couple of years ago. Um, you know, so we're in a position where we're not going to slow down the replacement of Wells 5 and 6. It just may be on us to fund it as it originally was said. Money -wise, yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, I wish I had better information or more information on it, but that's where we are right now. So, did that answer your question, Steve? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so, on the topics not anticipated, there are some concerns with the Campanelli sewer transfer that was before the board back in March. Um, they came before you guys and asked for a right of first refusal. Uh, to be waived for the sewer capacity and allow the transfer of the remaining sewer capacity from Campanelli to TPC Charities for two parcels of land at Arnold Palmer, Arnold yeah, Palmer Boulevard. That. So that's the entrance to the TPC. There's two parcels on the left, uh, one on the left, one on the right of the main entrance there um, that were owned by Campanelli. One of those properties had existing sewer capacity which was unused and being paid for which is the 45,000 the other does not have sewer capacity on it and being paid for it's just a pro property with land okay. um, when it was disclosed to the board it was they were asked uh, the board was asked by the gentleman that came in I, I cannot remember his name um, to transfer the sewer capacity to both of those parcels the board approved which that, we did which we did that so we have reached out to them to ask how they want that 45,000 divvied up between the two parcels. Okay. Um, because currently we only have one is active with sewer capacity. So not a big deal. We can so we made that. a mistake in calling it one parcel, basically. No, it was, it was the way it was explained. They, they, they didn't explain it in a way that, you know, both parcels had sewer capacity and were adding this to it. It was a simple ask for the 45,000 um, to be transferred to them. So it's, it's really something very simple we can do okay. in our system. Um, what's more concerning is not that we approve the 45,000 gallons per day of sewer capacity to be transferred, but we told them that it would be approved um, waiting, waiting on the paperwork from their attorney. Um, we've been back and forth with their attorney. Well, the first document that we got didn't have a signature section for the board. So we explained to them we need to have three signatures. Yep. And then after reviewing the document and after um, our previous office administrator, Rose, had come in, she comes in on occasion to help us out with uh, end of the year things um, as we are still working through a few uh, changes here in, uh, with employment. She found in the document that, and she remembered this more than she found it, she was able to dig through and, and find in the original agreement that there was an agreement that was done. I don't know if any, I don't know if Steve was on the board, Beth. I think it actually supersedes him. Um, on top of the 45,000 gallons of capacity that Campanelli had, they approached the town and asked for a special agreement to be made where 70,000 gallons of sewer capacity would be held and they wouldn't have to pay for it. And it would be an agreement that was made between the town manager and the Board of Selectmen 
and Campanelli. Um, as I'm told, it was not recommended by the Water Commission at the time, although they did eventually sign off on it. So this is the privately owned sewer capacity that, like we talked about, that they're really paying the MFN. We're just facilitating the bill for them. Right. That's what we're doing, right? Yeah. So seventy thousand gallons was allocated out of Norton's share, and it was to be held in case Campanelli wanted to do something with it. And what they did is they put a twenty thousand dollar bond in place. They gave it to the town at the time because it was prior to the sewer department be an enterprise and that was to be put in an interest bearing account and if they terminated the agreement or was to use this that money plus interest would be returned to them and the seventy thousand dollars or up to the seventy thousand gallons would be available to them so it was not a win for anybody um, where the money has to be returned to them either at the end of the 15 year contract or you know, if they breach the agreement. So you said the 70000 is the Norton share, so it's... It was part of Norton's share. So it's not the original 250 that Campanelli... No. Got it. Okay. No. Um, so that was that was on hold. That was part of the, the town share. So for 10 years now, we've been unable to use that 70,000 gallons of capacity. Thankfully, we haven't had to. But we've sold the pay for it. And yes. they haven't paid anything off. That is correct. <sighs> Um, that was never disclosed at the meeting where the gentleman came before the board via Zoom. Right. The only thing that was talked about was the 45,000 gallons, and he mentions that in the meeting John had gone back yeah. and reviewed. Um, so that brings up a, a lot of questions. And the 45,000 is separate from the 70. Correct. Like two different allotments. Correct. 45,000 is the private Campanelli side of it. Own. That's where some of the confusion is, is we don't know whether TPC charities is expecting just to take the 45000 over with the transfer of land because it said in the meeting that TPC Charities has a bill and has been paying this bill for this 45000 So as far as what I can understand, that has nothing to do with that other 70000 that Campanelli okay. has. Where I'm confused is, was the 70000 allotted to a specific piece of property? And if it was, I'm pretty sure it says in the agreement that it can't be transferred to another piece of property. It can only be transferred with that piece of property. Okay. So I don't really know where the 70,000 gallon figure came from originally. I, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure how it even got brought up into this. Um, but. So if the. Do we have documentation of all of this? We do. I believe. Brooke, did we send a copy of that to them? Yes. We did, right? Yeah, I believe it should be in your you guys' email. It's a lengthy document. Um, so there's multiple questions that come up with what happened here. If they only want the 45,000 gallons to be transferred from Campanelli to TPC Charities and it's to be split between the two properties that were given to them, that, that's very simple. You know, the board approved yeah, that it. Sounds cut dry. Very simple. If they're expecting the 45,000 of suits, thousand gallons of sewer capacity and the seventy thousand just because it's in a written agreement, that was never disclosed and never voted on. You know, it shouldn't automatically transfer with the property because it was a special agreement that was done between the town and Campanelli, not the town right. and TBC charities. Right, right. So it would I'm not so it was an agreement it was an agreement with the owner of the property, not the property. Right. So that's what these other things are. It, it there's just like John said, there's many questions that come up from that and until we have answers from them uh, according to emails that have been going back and forth with Brooke and um, I believe it was uh, somebody standing in for the original attorney because somebody was out mm -hmm. it, it appears they know of this 70,000 and anticipated that was coming with it why it wasn't disclosed at the meeting that we had with them so they knew about it when they were presented it, it sounds that way without seeing anything in writing and then actually putting a gallon total down that yeah. they expect to get this. That's kind of what we're hearing, waiting for. We have emails out to them. Um, it's just concerning that it was never disclosed yeah. to the board. You know, and if it does transfer or is able to be transferred, I would have to say that the board would have to have a vote to approve that it goes across. So 
employees. So do you, or Brooke, do you know, at 70000 is it attached to the properties, either of those properties? Was it previously allocated? Like, where, like does the most other, we have to have a piece of property, just like we did with that last one, it has to go with a piece of property. Right, it has to be where does the 70000 originate from? If it's just out there in the ether, right, then right. it can't be transferred. And if it is with that property, it's probably in the board's best interest to say, no, we do want that back. Why would we yeah, give you 70,000 capacity? Would, that, that would end up giving them 110,000 gallons for, for the cost of, on top of the, for the cost the of, of 70 and the 45 yeah. for, for the that cost. cost. And that sounds like, without knowing any other, that sounds like a lot of sewer capacity for that plot of land. I mean, I mean, I know it's big and everything, but yeah. I'd like really to see deep, where the seventy thousand you know. was originally originated from. Yeah, the concern. That's what it sounds like. We need to see the original documentation for that to see who actually. So the original document started back in nineteen ninety eight. We have not been able to find a copy of the original document. We have a copy of the twenty thirteen yeah. um, amendment or whatever. You, whatever. You that's want to in that it. email with all those documents. It's in there. So yeah, sent to you guys that. there. So. There's nothing in the 2013 document that really dictates a, a parcel or anything that I could read and understand. So it seems like it was very vague, which doesn't surprise me if it was drafted up to be that way. Um, you know, Campanelli is asking for the $20,000 to be returned to them because they no longer own the properties. They were gifted to um, TBC charities. So with the return of that money, I would automatically assume that the sewer capacity that was held and not used is returned to the town to yeah, be sold off at like will. But it appears, again, I hate to, to just make assumptions, that TPC Charities is under the assumption that that is going to them with the transfer. So there's, something isn't well, if the town has the right of first refusal, there's no reason to give up 70,000 free sewer capacity. Right. No, especially since technically we're still paying for that capacity. Right. Right. right? Exactly. Which we would still be paying for the capacity if we Correct. gave it to them. Which well, those type of agreements are not recorded with the property? Good question. So if somebody was to give me a parcel number, I can do the research right. Oh. We will uh, see if we can find that. Yeah, I know the parcel numbers that got transferred, but I don't but know where the, where the, original where the 70, I mean, If the original agreement was to the person, not the, the land, then you'll probably never find any reference to a parcel at all. Right. Which right. is it's still person. Agreement. Right. If it's to a parcel, then it's, you know, it would Traceable. Go, because if it was recorded, then it would be with the parcel, mm -hmm. not with the person. Yeah, we'll definitely look into it a little bit further, but this is, again, it's not on, on the meeting as a topic. This is just general yep. discussion that yep. we're going about and you know, trying to determine what the next step would be. Obviously, I think we're going to need to have them zoom in or, or come in to explain some of this if we can't get it hashed out um, and get the answers that we're looking for in email. Um, you know, according to the document that we saw, it was for 15, I forget exactly how it was worded, I thought they had had it down. the date on the agreement through the 15th anniversary. So it sounds like it is, it was, it was approved for 15 years. So if it's 15 years from 2013, obviously there's still five more years to go. If the TPC definitely needs this capacity and the board wants to approve, or this does transfer and we find out legally it has to go, you know, the 20,000 would have to come from TPC charities and be put into an account to hold this agreement right. in place you know, for those five years. That's the only way I see it being fair, even though it's really not a fair agreement at all. Yeah. Um, but there's just, there's mo more questions than answers. I guess yeah. I want to make sure you guys are aware of how, how confusing this has gotten on this end, um, just because it wasn't all disclosed yeah. at the original meeting we had with them. I'll go through those the, those documents again, mm -hmm. refresh my memory on them. We should put them on an the agenda coming up soon. Yeah. You ask some questions and get some clarity. We will definitely do that. Right. So um, the other item that I have, which I believe is the last item, and John might have something, um, is a tower lease discussion. So the town manager is drafting a sublease agreement with DISH 5G. 
Um, we share a location at 24 Cottage Street, which is our elevated water tank. Um, subleases are allowed based on, based on the agreements that we have. Um, after reviewing the document, it's pretty standard legal language, everything is there. Um, the only real concern that we have and we need to come up with an amount for is if the carrier was to terminate the agreement with us and basically just leave, um, which would obviously leave us with the antennas, the cables, the base unit. And your notebook. And we found uh, another carrier who's leaving a different tower has a removal bond of only $5,000, which is very small. Yeah, the well. agreement is very old, which obviously dictates why the price is small and it hasn't changed over the years. Most of these agreements are set in place. They go for a number of years with automatic renewals for multiple years. So it's not uncommon to go 12 or 15 years before somebody's lease agreement is up. Um, over that course of time, they can come in, they can replace their antennas, they can upgrade things as long as it doesn't exceed the original agreed number of devices, which more times than not, we see devices being taken down and smaller antennas being put yeah. up. Um, just as technology changes, but the biggest concern is that you know we know it'll cost more than five thousand dollars if a carrier up and leaves and leaves everything there. Um, so we need to come up with a determination for what the removal bond number should be, and basically what that is: if the carrier damages the property or fails to remove any or all of the equipment, we have the opportunity to take legal action and go and attach that legal right. bond that was put in place for removal. Um, you know, attaching 5000 or $10,000 isn't going to do anything in today's day and age. Um, yeah, I, I think it sounds like it should be a lot more than that. Right. Um, as I know we had talked, you know, mentioned before, you, you really want to have the incentive for them yeah. to remove these devices at their cost. You know, not give them an option, hey, well, $10,000, I'll walk away from that. Yeah. You know, it's going to cost me twice as much to get rid of it. Um, so that's where we are now. Um, I know Mr. Bernstein had mentioned this to determine if there's a mass general law pertaining to the limit that we could put on that. We would have to look into that, touch base with legal counsel. Um, I know John had thrown some numbers around um, that we were talking about. We were in the, I think, thirty-five to yeah. $50,000 yeah. range. Yeah. Um, just didn't know what the board's thoughts were on that. I wanted to actually talk to you, Steve, and see if you guys had anything similar in place in Mansfield. Um, some of your equipment over there is a little bit newer. Is that something you're familiar with? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't, um, I'd have to look into that because uh, I, I don't get involved in that area, at least in my capacity. Good choice. So I, can, I definitely have a couple people that I will ask. Okay. Yeah, I feel like that's a pretty fair number, especially since it's not like they're going to create this lease and then walk away from it tomorrow. You know right. I mean? that's, right. It's all relative, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you get a chance to uh, to text some of those people, maybe we can come up with a number. I mean, uh, it's not very common that we see vacancies on the tanks, so this is going to be a, a long-term commitment, and we want to make sure by the end date that we still have enough yeah. bond in place, you know, that it's going to cover it. So, well, considering that, that it's you're looking at possibly decades down the road, I'm thinking that number wants to be maybe twice what it would actually cost to do it. Yeah. Whatever that number is. What's the initial term? Oh, the uh, lease. That is in writing. I did not read through that whole thing. Um, it's not important. It, it is out there. Because dish 5G might be dish 7G. But we're not going to talk about mm -hmm. this. But I don't even know what 5G is yet. So. That's making everybody's flip phones not work anymore. <laughs> Steve's gonna have to get a new phone. I know. But uh, that's basically all I have. So I want to make sure you guys are aware of those discussions going on. It's uh, uh, 60 months with uh, automatic renewal for four additional 60 months. Six terms. Six five zero. Years, six zero. Six zero. Yeah. So, so five years, and then after the initial term, automatically renew for. Up to four or more five years. So yeah, you're at, so that could be 25, 25 years. So you're, at 20, you're at 25 yeah. years. So yeah. Yeah. Ten thousand dollars today isn't going to be the same. Yeah. <laughs> 25 years. You have from to now. do a present worth analysis on your money. Remember how to do that? 
so probably I'm, not. Huh? It slipped my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I know my wall is not as fat as it used to be, if that's what you're saying. That's what I'm saying, right? <laughs> so that is all I have. Okay. So my question is, uh, what's happening with this? And I'm sure you don't know is the whole DPW thing. What's the buzz? Uh, really, no buzz. The next really step, I believe, is six months. Probably, it, it'll take some time. Um, I believe that's going to go on to the um, on the ballot for a vote. Yeah, is the next step. Table. Well, I can't do that until. I mean, um, there's going to be a lot of work ahead of time in order to put it on the ballot. I would think. You can't just put it on the ballot and think it's going to just fall into place afterwards. I think they can now. They passed the article past the town meeting, so. No, I understand, but it won't work that way. I, know, I agree with you. <laughs> okay. But but all they really have to do at this point, they could do nothing and just put it on the ballot. Right. I mean, yeah. There's, there's been no discussion about it. There's been nothing that I've seen as topics in meetings. Um, if I see something, I'll definitely make you aware of it. But uh, as far as it is right I mean, now, they I didn't really do the due diligence that you suggested should be done. No reason I think you're going to do that in the next 12 months. Um, next 12 months, whatever. Okay. I, I'd like to think that I'm wrong about that. <laughs> so, is this something we should be proactive on or be reactive on or no active on? It doesn't affect me either way. The concern I have is that it's a money grab for the other town departments. You know, we're water and sewers enterprise. We're the only department in town that generates revenue. We have to have a certain amount of revenue in our retained earnings to remain certified as an enterprise account, to have monies to um, make immediate repairs if there's major emergencies. Our numbers right now are very close to, um, well, as I mentioned before, it's as low as it's been in retained earnings. and. Um, we're supposed to have a certain percentage of our most valuable asset, which has changed, which prior it was our elevated tanks, and now with the implementation of the water treatment facility, it's that. So the retained earnings number should be much higher than it is. We have monies in place that would be able to start in immediate repair if there was something that was damaged that was major, and then the rest of the money would have to come from bonds or borrows. Do we ever hear from the state if that gets too low? they get upset about that? Or? I haven't heard from the state. Um, we spoke with our um, the company that does our rate studies, um, a professional firm that we've used for many years, and it's a recommendation to have this percentage held at a certain amount, but there is nothing in law or in okay. writing that dictates it has to be done that way. That's what I was wondering. If there's a, a level at which yeah. it drops below, it triggers some kind of... The, the chances are it, it could affect the town's bond or borrowing rate if you didn't have certain monies in place. Um, but I think that would be when you get down to a very low, low number. Right. Um, you know, we're very low right now. We're at like 1.1 or 1.2 million in reserve for water, which is, it's never been that low. Yeah. But we have responsibilities. We have costs that we have to pay back to the town for each employee that we have. It was just probably twice that year ago, wasn't it? At, oh, yeah, at least. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, a lot of times we try and pull projects out of that so that the number doesn't get too high. You know, and we keep a, an average where, where we feel it should be, where it's comfortable. Um, that's where our vehicle replacements come from, so we don't actually borrow or pull leases out. You know, we buy them outright with the, uh, the discounted rate. Uh, so it's definitely something we have to keep an eye on. And uh, as budgets and costs increase, a lot of times you supplement your budget with monies from your retained earnings. So that's another reason why you have to have a certain amount in there, you know, as a, a fallback. Yeah. You know, we know chemicals have increased drastically, cost of fuel has increased drastically. Um, samples, everything's going up. So it's uh, just something to keep an eye on. Okay. So on the tower lease um, aspect of what we were just talking about, what do you mean it or, and how are you going to proceed to resolve that? That was going to be presented at the next select board meeting, I believe. Whichever one is the next week. I think there's one tomorrow. Okay. I, think I, think there's, there's, I think that's I think there's a number that needs to be agreed on by you guys. Um, and Either 
particular number or a range, and we can reach out to legal and see if there's anything in the mass general laws that's going to not The range that you guys just threw out there, 35 to 50, I'd be inclined to go to the top end of that range. So, okay. I agree. Yeah. Steve, how about you? You got a. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. I've been having coffee fits over here. I apologize. No, no worries. We we're just talking about the range that we should attempt to put in for the removal bond for the power lease. We're thinking 35 to 50. Um, hopefully more on the 50 side, unless we find out otherwise that it can't be allowed by Mass General Law, which may have a limitation on it. Uh, I think we yeah, can. That should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, it can't be five. It should, oh, so it can't, can't be ten. Five. Yeah, five, five or ten just doesn't work. And I, I think we go high because right, of right, the, right. The, the term, I mean, 20, 25 year term. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think yeah, if there's not at least a three or a four in that 10,000 spot, then. <laughs> right. So it's too okay. low. All right. So we'll. <clears throat> you got anything, John? I don't believe so. No, I got one more thing. <laughs> the lead and copper samples um, that we have taken are have been slow to return, which yep. is unfortunately not common. Um, add to that the turnaround time from the lab. Not, not uncommon. Uh, there you go. Not, not uncommon. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> add to that the turnaround time from the lab, and we have exceeded the window in which we have to report. Oh boy. So we will be getting more than likely a notice of non-compliance for reporting violations because the lab and the homeowners have created delays that are out of our control. So all the samples have been taken, all the sample results will be distributed to the homeowners and schools and daycares as required, but if you don't have them in by the 10th of the following month after the quarter closes, which the 10th was on a Sunday. Yep. Um, we had a short week because of the July 4th holiday, so it gave a, a, a four-day window for the lab to have the samples turned around. Even though they've had them since the middle of June, we have, there's obviously other people that are taking yeah, the samples sure, at the sure. same time. So like we've else. run into this one other time before, um, probably three years ago, and you know, it's something, it's unfortunate that DEP doesn't give you an extension you know, we've done everything we can on our end. You know, samples. We can't apply for some kind of no. extension. That's it. No. Nope. No. I gave them a heads up that okay. we didn't have the sample results, and they said, "Them's the breaks. R rules are rules." So, so our sample results seem to be fine, mm -hmm. um, but. So how does it shake down? Do we get a fine? Or? No, no. It's a, a notification that goes in the CCR. The end of the year report that we put out, consumer, consumer confidence report, um, that indicates we had a reporting violation. Um, the last time we did that, we explained that it was a delay from homeowner, homeowner returns yep. and the lab, and that's basically where it is. It's and that just, explanation goes in the report as yep. well. Okay. It, it's just one more thing. It just obviously doesn't make you look good. But yeah. It's for a sample that's out of our control and turnaround times that we have no control over. You know, it's not a sample that we can do in house. Yeah, it's just the way it works. Yeah. So again, this mass DEP has the rules and regulations in place that you have to abide by. You can only distribute your samples during a certain time, and they expect the homeowners to snap and have it back the next day, which doesn't ever happen. Yeah. And then you run into holidays like we just had with the 4th of July. There has to be other towns that run into this as well. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. unfortunately a very common post that you see for non-compliance or paperwork, basically, is what it is. Just putting that out there. Right. I was trying to forget the bad news. I know it was. I'm good for that, though. Well, we thank you for telling us the bad news, the good news, and everything else in between. We because, very well. uh, we'd rather you tell us. Mm. Oh, no, we're, we're open about it. It's, no, I mean, it's unfortunate. You know, well, I, you know, I always tell my clients, I, you know, I tell you the good, bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. Who else is going to tell you? Right? Yeah, it's bad news, but nobody did anything wrong. It was no. like. <laughs> Well, even you know, it's if, one thing if you make a mistake. Well, even if you make bad. a mistake, it's better that you just you oh, know, yeah. hold it. Yeah. 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 Go with it. Definitely. So that is all I have before I think of something else. Good job.
Am I? <laughs> I think I am. I think I am. Steve, you good? All set. Yep. I'm very good. Yes, thanks. You have to be careful about Steve. Yeah, right. When's our next meeting? Uh, 26th, I believe. 26th? Yeah, I have it down to 26th. 20, yeah. Oh, is it 26th, I believe? Yeah. Yeah, it's got to be 14 days from now, right? All right, I guess if everybody's good, I would like to make a motion to adjourn this evening's meeting of the Water and Sewer Commissioners. Seconded. All better? Aye. 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 Hope you feel better, Steve. Yeah, hope you feel better, Steve. Thanks. See you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys.